This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000-year odyssey. And as we know, the hemp plant produces lots of wonderful things. It's a God-given plant. It's a weed, and it just grows. However, the part of the plant that is for medical cannabis is the flower. And then there is the hashish, and then there's the industrial hemp, and all of these wonderful things that God gave us. And then we have little, little dwarf, what's his name, Sessions, trying to, oh, never mind, let's don't go there. Anyway, today we are going to talk to a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful friend of mine, Tanya <laughs> Johnson from Noah Botanicals. Now, Noah Botanicals is one of the newest uh, dispensaries to come on board. And as you know, the state made all of this legal in 2002, and they're just getting around to opening the dispensaries. <gasps> oh God, if you'd been, wor been <laughs> sick and waiting on this, just, anyway, <laughs> let's stop. This, uh, welcome, Tanya. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here talking to you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. So, tell us exactly what is medical cannabis? And how does it differ from recreational cannabis? Hmm. So the plant itself is the plant. Um, there's some difference between industrial hemp and the cannabis that is regulated federally by mm -hmm. the government. And it, it relates to one component of the plant, which is the THC content. Right. So what's different in Hawaii from the rest of the mainland is that we're medical only, which means you have to ha meet a qualifying condition and have a medical card to possess, grow your own, or buy uh, from a dispensary. The components of and the plant that is used for medical and recreational are the same. Mm -hmm. It's just um, different laws. The only difference in states in the mainland that have adopted recreational use as well is as a medical patient, you can continue to see discounts on taxes and you in some states can buy higher dosages of the same product that cannot be purchased on the recreational side. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So now, since this is Hawaii and it's mm -hmm. medical only, do you grow your own or how, how is sure. that done? So that's, um, it's a, a unique situation. So I, I came on board with NOAA after the license was won, um, awarded. And so a little bit, I'm not, I've watched some of your other videos and who, who you've brought on. What's unique to Hawaii is that we're a vertically integrated model, business model here. Um, and so when the regulations were being put forward and the number of dispensaries was being decided, I wasn't involved in any of that and I wasn't even exposed to the industry at that point. So there are a lot of different business models for the cannabis industry across the United States. Hawaii chose to adopt a vertical uh, system uh, at this point in time. Uh, and so what that means is each licensee has to grow, manufacture, and sell our own. So when I came on board, standing up this company is essentially standing up four companies at the same time. We're bringing a brand new team together. Once the license was awarded, we had to build a company um, and then at the same time, we were a construction company building our facilities. Oh, wow. And now you're an agricultural business growing a plant, and you're a manufacturing operation taking that plant and turning it into your any product you see, right? right? Your tinctures, your lozenges, your vape oil, any of that. And then you're, you're now opening and running a retail location as well. Oh, my. Yeah, so we've been open since October 9th, and one of... Um, one of the areas of education that we work with the most with our patients who have maybe been to the mainland and been exposed on the mainland to a horizontal model is just that, that um, anticipating what patients may want and need with a plant that takes four months to grow and not only what types they might want but the volume mm -hmm. that, that they will purchase and then the amount of time that it takes once the plant is ready to sell as flower to then go through a manufacturing and extraction process and all of that testing and then put it on the shelf is incredibly challenging. It is. Now, 
you said, okay, that's four different businesses. Yeah, all at once. All but at it, once. Yes, so each yep. licensee has to do that. And so that's why you that's why you may see variety amongst the licensees and when we're getting open, what we're opening with, what we're able to keep in stock, um, and the frequency with which you know we can restock. So do you let's say that I am a farmer mm -hmm. and I know how to grow your particular plant. Mm -hmm. Could I then just work for you to put this business together mm -hmm. and then here's another dispensary that needs my services. Can that person grow? So you could. No, 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 I'm just right. saying that to create four different businesses. Right, I see what you're getting yeah. at. So, could, so could from you, an ancillary support right. service, right. Uh, so no. no, so when it, there are a lot of ancillary um, businesses that support our industry here in Hawaii that have created new businesses that didn't right. exist before, which I love. I'm hugely I, I did, passionate I would, about that. I would think right. so. So yeah. we, um, the company that we get all of our bottles from are a local startup that started uh, through UH Scheidler um, that supply all of the dram jars and everything that we need to use. So everywhere we can, we're encouraging entrepreneurs who want to attach to the industry somehow um, to help them figure out how they can do it and service the industry. There are some areas that are very, very clear in the law that we cannot. So the plants is a good example. Um, we, uh, we cannot sell clones or seeds or even donate clones or seeds to patients or anyone else. Um, and we, we can't take them either. Well, so, I was thinking more of another dispensary, not, not the right. patient, but another dispensary. If I say I can build this for you, right. and now I have built this facility for you, I can I, like any other contractor, go do it go for someone, someone else. else. There is, that would depend on each licensee's um, confidentiality agreements, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are some things that state regulated during the startup process um, of whether uh, a particular person or entity could be attached to do two dispensaries at the same time. Yeah. Right. Just because it's, you know, there's concern uh, and, you know, uh, uh, this several business models were presented as the business model that would be right for Hawaii's beginning part right. of the industry. Um, and there are, you know, benefits and drawbacks of any of those business models. And I was just thinking mm -hmm. of all of the allied businesses that can mm -hmm. support right. this industry. Because I, right. oh, since you know, in July, I had no idea mm -hmm. of any of this. And I've just watched it yeah. grow yeah. just since I've been doing the program. And it seems like there's such an opportunity for so many mm -hmm. new businesses mm -hmm. to support yeah. that. Yeah. And I agree, and I definitely can see a path forward for that. And for me personally, um, what this industry itself can do for the economy in the state of Hawaii in a variety of fashions over the next three to five oh, years yes. is encouraging uh, to me. It's the, the amount of time it may take to have that happen. So right now, today, what can happen are those ancillary businesses can come up. For example, there are things that either don't financially make sense for each dispensary to do um, because we're doing as much as we can to keep the cost as low as possible. Um, we, we already have so many challenges by being vertically integrated um, and being a startup still, a startup industry, right? right? We have to remember that the state got this all going at the same time we all are. And so we're working well together, but we're all still, this is year one, right, really, of anyone being in operation and the majority of the dispensaries aren't open yet. We don't even have, we have four open um, Where right the now. Other two? two on Maui and two here on Oahu. And the two here are so close together. We're across so the street it, from each other. And mm -hmm. if you live in uh, right. what is it, North Shore, or Wai 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 Wai, and you've got yeah. to, so that's a whole day trip. Mm -hmm. It is. And we have patients who, who, you know, they plan doctor's appointments or whatever in town. I used to live country. I grew up in remote, remote country. <laughs> and, you know, you go to town once a month and do your Costco shopping and whatever else, and then you don't come back again. So that's definitely a challenge. And we are allowed, each licensee is allowed to have three retail locations. Um, but this year in particular will, every year in any new business, and particularly a new industry, um, it is a little bit of wait and see mm -hmm. with how much risk can we take. And so the card, the patient card counts are not um, increasing at the rate we, we would had hoped to see. 
Um, and so looking at the expense of opening a second retail location, producing enough volume um, to handle both locations, and looking at the number of cardholders currently on the island of Oahu, it's an, a matter of, you know, of economy. Well, now, the state says that they issue about 1800 a month. Mm -hmm. So that includes renewals. Unfortunately, right now, there's not a way to know whether they're new patients or existing patients renewing. Mm -hmm. um, so if you were to open a new place, that mm -hmm. would be retail only? It yeah, wouldn't, so wouldn't e be the growing and all so the So each other. licensee can have two grow centers, up to two grow centers and three retail locations. So that you could conceivably grow where you are right. and just have a storefront. Absolutely. Right. And on the North Shore right. place. So we chose, um, Noah chose to go ahead and build a production facility to handle the capacity of plants and inventory we estimated would be uh, three to five years from now. So we wouldn't need to construct our second production facility for a while and could just ramp up the number of plants we're growing in our existing facility to handle different retail locations. Yeah. That makes sense to mm -hmm. me, that yeah. rather than build the whole thing out, which would increase the cost. Right. So if you just mm -hmm. uh, had another retail mm -hmm outlet. Yeah, yeah. That, and that's, that's where we all want to be, right? Um, all of the licensees want to be able to provide medicine to as many people as possible. Um, there are very strict requirements about where our stores can be located in terms of distances to schools or public housing, and we're on an island. Right. So all three of the current licensees on Oahu, our first storefronts are all within a mile of each other, and we <laughs> didn't even know it until we all got close <laughs> to opening, and then we were like, you're there. Oh, of course. But if you think about it, especially on an island, you're so it really restricts where you can even have a shop. Um, so, so while we're all allowed to, basically we could eventually have nine dispensary locations on this island, nine storefronts, right, mm -hmm. between the three of us. Where are they all going to go? Are there even nine locations on the island that fit in all of those criteria? So it can't that's be a near a school. Can't public housing. Public housing. Um, it cannot have a lien or a loan on it because the, you can't have a bank or a loan or a mortgage attached right. to it because it's federally illegal. So yeah, once you go through the whole list, it's really very restrictive. <laughs> That's absurd. <laughs> yeah. There is, um, you know, it is convenient for the patients though. Um, to be able to just, you know, be, especially if they're coming from out of town, you know, they can, they can just shop through, you know, like we do at Ala Moana. So, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it is, I think, it's an interesting industry for me to come into, having come out of the one that I did. So I see it a little bit differently than I hear people speaking about it and working with the regulators. Um, so it's, it's challenging, um, but... I'm also very, very glad we're here now today um, and that we are open and we are able to start providing, you know, medicine to patients. Well, uh, Tanya, we need to take a break mm -hmm. and we will be right back and with Tanya Johnson from NOAA Botanicals. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I said I could play, so I ain't chance to play at all. You know, that's my life. I love music. Yeah, I saw we do it. Some say scuba divers are the poor man's astronaut. At Dive Heart, we believe that to be true. We say forget the moon. Dive Heart can help children, adults, and veterans of all abilities escape gravity right here on Earth. Search DiveHeart.org and imagine the possibilities in your life. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we're back with Tanya Johnson from mm -hmm. NOAA Botanicals. And this 
beautiful lady you wouldn't think was a CEO. COO. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we C -O -O. have a CEO. <laughs> COO. So t t tell us about you. Tell, tell yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So I grew up in a small town in northeastern Wyoming. Um, my family are cattle ranchers. Um, my parents were very young when I was born. Um, and then we, I actually finished school, high school in northern Nevada. My dad was working in the gold mines. Um, I got married very young, had a couple of kids very young, uh, and then struck out on my own and went back to school. Uh, I moved to Idaho, and so my um, formal education is actually in anthropology and archaeology um, and business. So um, I, I came out of that experience and moved to Utah, and uh, it wasn't actually practical for me to be an archaeologist in the way they worked at the time because I was a single mom and I couldn't be gone for days and weeks yes. on end. So because I had some business savvy and some other skills that I had um, accrued along the way, I immediately went into the business side of the organization. So I was in environmental consulting, which um, covers everything, okay. water, plants, animals, everything. everything. Um, and so it was just an amazing opportunity, a melting pot of regulatory environments and um, law and statute and all kinds of things that I grew up in for about 15 years. And along the way, um, I really attached to the inner workings of the business. The company was quite small when I started and they were all interested in being scientists and not running a business. So I got a lot of free range to um, just figure things out and run with things. And so I wound up where the last five years that I was there, I was turning around failing operations, starting new ones, bringing large scale pipeline projects, and very <laughs> contentious, very in oh, the media, yes. in the news projects, um, you know, back on track or out of litigation or deciding whether we were even going to stay attached. And so um, I moved to Hawaii in 2011. I came here on vacation and decided I needed <laughs> to live here. So I went home and packed up my kids and came out. Um, so I, I continued in the environmental uh, world when, when I moved to Hawaii. Um, the scope changed, of course, from archaeological projects to ocean work and wa a lot of water work and oh, things yes. like that. But um, the thing that's interesting, so when this opportunity came up for me to come in and help start up this company, and in the ca I, I knew absolutely nothing about cannabis, had never even consumed it. I just had no reason to have an opinion about it, right? Um, and so it's been an amazing learning curve, but from more from the perspective of sitting at a table with six or eight regulators with laws that have been in effect for 30, 40, 50 years, and you can't get anyone to budge on anything. And so trying to affect change at any kind of a scale is just embryonic, oh, the pace. Oh. And so coming into this industry, while it's super sexy and exciting and it's what everybody's talking about right now, for me, it's, it, it's, it's, um, really nice to just have one regulator at the table um, and what I've seen in Hawaii with this industry also being a new industry for the state standing up the dispensary system is the willingness to sit down at the table with all eight licensees and talk through things that were written into law or statute before any of us were trying to actually make this work mm -hmm. right and so now that we're operational we're able to sit down and say this is working this isn't and now that we're open being able to take feedback from patients back to them and say, for example, um, pre-filled vape cartridges. Currently we What are is a pre-filled vape sure. cartridge? Sure. So you can smoke the flower, you can have a tincture, you can have uh, an edible cooking oil. We're not allowed to sell edibles in the state right now. Um, the other area we, we are restricted that you won't see on the mainland is we can't um, sell anything that contributes to, contributes to the smoking of cannabis. So we can't sell any of the paraphernalia um, that they would need to consume mm -hmm. it. And that includes, if you've seen like vape pens or e-cigarettes, people walking around smoking the electronic devices. Oh, yeah. So you can create a, a distillate, a vape oil that goes in that cartridge that people um, prefer to use um, to medicate rather than um, having to grind flour and smoke flour and all of that. And so um, particularly for patients that have um, seizures or rheumatoid arthritis or Parkinson's, um, right now we're not allowed to sell those cartridges already filled with the liquid. So on the mainland you can buy the whole cartridge, you just screw it on the pen and you can inhale. Here you have to get this kit and then the way you buy that oil from us is a syringe and so you have to very carefully hold the syringe and slowly fill it because it's like caro syrup consistency. 
into the, the cartridge and then screw the top on and you have to get it on right and all this stuff has to happen oh my. Um, before you can use it. So, so if you have arthritis, oh. yeah, oh my goodness. shakes or anything else. Mm -hmm. And so there's some limitations there that, you know, the intent was there when it was written and put of together. Course. But now that we're on the ground, boots on the ground, if you will, with this stuff, we're starting to see where there are some limitations. So the other thing about the state that I appreciate is that every year a cleanup bill goes through, right? And so um, last year, what was most significant for the dispensaries was we were allowed to increase our plant count in our buildings and also add a third dispensary. What was significant for patients who home grow is they were allowed to go from seven plants to 10 plants and also the period of time they can continue growing their own extended. So. Um, I think, you know, it's progressive even though it feels like it's slow and it's been a long time coming. Well, I know the big issue for some of our mm -hmm. regular listeners is descheduling. Yeah. And hopefully that can happen. Yeah. Um, so many of our legislators do not understand that in 2006, the U.S. Supreme Court said the states have a right, and mm -hmm. it kills me to say states' rights, mm -hmm. but we do. Yeah. And so many of the legislators do not understand. And so that's a big issue. Yeah, and I think that for me, and, and because of how we know each other and we've met, you'll, you'll, you'll understand this, right? Um, I, I spend space in my life thinking and planning about how what I'm doing today can affect things tomorrow. tomorrow. But the truth is, the most power I have is what I can do today with the, with the tools I have available to me. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and maybe I can say this because I was not attached to the industry before. I also had no opinion about cannabis before. What I had was a passive opinion, and I didn't see that until, you know, six or eight months ago when we were developing our mission and vision statement. And what I mean by that is, I learned somewhere along the way in school that cannabis was a gateway drug into opioids, the Reagan era, right? right. This is when I grew up. And I just never decided to think anything other than that. I didn't educate myself, I didn't inform myself. So when this opportunity came to me that I sat down and I did a bunch of research to decide whether it was something I wanted to be a part of. From a business perspective, yes. Starting up a business from scratch, yes, bring it on. But I have to believe in what I'm doing as well and the goal of what I'm doing. And so, um, as I, I mean, the cultural, you know, the defacing of different cultures, by using it in that way um, to break apart different cultural groups and just the history of the criminalization of the plant just blew me away, it, right? It, and, yes, and that did yes, it. it does. And so, <laughs> yeah, so for me moving forward now, the biggest thing is educating people and asking people to educate themselves. I mean, you have a, a smartphone, Google, spend five minutes Googling. You don't have to be out there waving a flag like I am, but at least be supportive that if a family member wants to, to explore this as an option for medicating themselves, um, you know whether you want to be supportive of that, of that or not, even if you don't want to use it, because there is still a lot of gray area and dark area, and people feel like they're doing something wrong or bad, and you well, know we don't want that. What I've, I've noticed is, of course, those people that still, even the attorney general sat right where you are and said he knew of his bias, mm -hmm. and it came from his parents telling him this was mm -hmm. a gateway drug. Mm -hmm. He said, while he knows better, mm -hmm. but there's still that part of him that's still there. That's still And he recognizes that, yeah. so it, that gave me hope, yeah. at least, yeah. that he recognizes yeah. that it's there. And that's what it will take, is more people talking about it in a different way. And I, personally, what happened when Jeff Sessions did what he did, is I appreciate when things like that happen, because things like that ignite actual activism. Right, and so something that may have been talked about for a long period of time, it infuriates people enough to actually step up and take action and force and voice. Right, um, so I'm encouraged to see. <laughs> well, you know, even what's in going the, on as a result of that. Even in the Congress, mm -hmm. this is hard to believe. There is a cannabis caucus, and it was created by Republicans, which is really hard to believe that <laughs> that they would take a stand. But most of them are from states where the hemp grows and right. it's an industry and they see what, mm -hmm. what it used to be mm -hmm. and how they made money and whatnot mm -hmm. with the industrial hemp. But, yep. 
since he has taken the stand, yes, I have seen more people talk about it, yeah. more people write about it. So I have to believe that that will have a good outcome. Well, and for me, it's economics, right? Yeah. I, I, as and even for the state of Hawaii, and when people come to me when I do talk story sessions and come to Brian, you know, we don't need a dispensary, we grow our own. I, I respect that there is a culture and a, and a group of people in the islands who have been doing this for a very long time, and I wouldn't want to take that away from them. Um, and, you know, we're another option yes. uh, for people who choose, choose, of course. choose, choose to have that. Uh, the, the financial the ability to make money, generate jobs, create another industry in the state of Hawaii outside of tourism um, that will keep a brain trust of people in the state and provide money to education, it, it seems like a no-brainer to me. Um, I, I totally agree with so, you. Like I said, in the months I've been doing this and just watching it mm -hmm. grow and the people I've mm -hmm. met, it is so different than what they would lead you to believe mm -hmm. some dark yeah dingy, you know, right. somebody on the right. corner. And, yeah. Right. Well, we're fighting the pop culture yes. vision of cannabis, right? I mean, that's where we are today. Because you might, one response I get is, oh, yeah, I did that in college. Yeah. And the other is, oh, you know, it's, it's a gateway drug. It's a bad thing. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Hawaii is the only state that in the legislature last year changed the name. Yes. It's from very encouraging. Marijuana to cannabis, yeah. medical cannabis. Yeah. While medical marijuana has a certain mm -hmm. lilt, certain mm -hmm. ring, but for the state yeah. to spend the money to change all of their yeah. literature to say medical cannabis. Well, darling, yep. it's been a pleasure. It's always I a pleasure so spending <laughs> time with you. <laughs> and you will come back? Yes, of course. Thank you yes, so thank much. Thank you, Marcia. Aloha, and we'll see you next time.